She said, this is the turning point in your life, this is what we're looking for. And indeed it was. It changes completely who you think you are. They're beautiful, they're colorful, they're vibrant. We acknowledge our differences, we embrace them, and then we use them to our advantage. The quality of one's heart is something that goes beyond whatever physical labels that we might put upon our bodies. This is when you are head over heels in love with someone and you have to shout it from the rooftop. When Srila Prabhupada came to this country, he did something that uh, was quite daring in the sense that his goal was to transplant a very well-established and very authentic and old tradition from India to the United States, to New York City, to the 60s counterculture. I mean, if you look at it comparatively, there couldn't be two more different cultures than these two. You know, this was the, the period of, uh, of drug use and everything else in New York City. There were people there who were literally uh, leaned up against the wall and given a, uh, given a rosary of beads to chant until they got their heads together. Prabhupada was the right person at the right time. Some say that it was providential that he came in the 1960s, that if he had come earlier, it might have been more difficult. There were other Swamis who had come earlier, uh, Vivekananda most famously, Yogananda and others. But when Prabhupada came, the culture seemed ripe for a new possibility. He had a following of young people, some of whom were long-term seekers, some of whom had been to, actually been to India looking for a teacher and hadn't found anybody, some of whom had tried out various religions and hadn't found them satisfactory. They found him to be the answer to their search. He not only was a, a man of considerable knowledge of his tradition and his scriptures and was able to make them available to those in the West, but he also excited people's hearts. This man did what many others could not do. His own devotion, his own faith, his conviction, his just very human way of dealing with people, his ability to bring enjoyment and delight into religion, but also have very strong rules, seemed to be a recipe for success and it seems that on every count he was able to change people's lives. I didn't feel that I had necessarily found something, but I did feel that the philosophy was very comprehensive and very intriguing and very holistic and gradually I started to change. My first encounter with, uh, with what is now called ISKCON was when I went to 26 Second Avenue in New York, which was the storefront temple that Prabhupada had just recently, a few months before, started uh, living and working in. And there was, in the window, there was a sign propped up on the windowsill that said, International Society of Krishna Consciousness. And I looked at that sign and I thought, 
you know, we're, we're, we're looking, standing in front of a storefront church in the grubby, run-down <laughs> Bowery district in New York, and here, here this, here's this, this sign saying, this is the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. <laughs> you know, this is, this is ridiculous. One day, someone uh, arrived at my place. I was living in, uh, near where Prabhupada started in the Bowery and uh, had a paper that was the incorporation of ISKCON, which I, I, I signed without reading very thoroughly, but I felt that it was a good thing that, that Prabhupada was incorporating his society. I didn't know what it would mean for the future. Although there are different types of yoga, bhakti yoga is the yoga of devotion. It's not a matter of exercise, it's not a matter of concentrating on a dot, but it's a matter of devoting oneself to the personality of Godhead. The word bhakti comes from the Sanskrit root bhaj, which means to share. And bhakti is all about sharing. It really cannot be done alone in a cave in the Himalayas. Bhakti is first and foremost about a relationship. And in most bhakti traditions, uh, there's a whole variety of different bhakti traditions, what's shared by these different traditions is the idea of establishing a personal, intimate, loving relationship with the divine as a personal God. I mean, there's something about the way in which Krishna is characterized as this God who is first and foremost the God of Leela. He's the God of play, and he's a joyous God. Bhakti is rooted in an ancient tradition, which is in contemporary times known as Hinduism. At the same time, the principles that are espoused are universal, they're applicable to everyone, they're accessible to everyone. Many traditions, if not all traditions, have this element of devotion. Uh, certainly, it's obvious in Christianity that there would be a strong sense of loving God, loving neighbor, loving God as God loves us. And I think in certain forms of Islam and Judaism, likewise, there would be a sense of devotion and love. And even in traditions that are not directly theistic, such as certain forms of Buddhism, there may be a, an attitude of bhakti or devotion toward the Buddha or toward one of the saints and so on like that. There's three major works that have really shaped classical and contemporary India. Uh, these are the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, and then the Bhagavata Purana. The Bhagavata Purana is a, a text that really breaks apart or questions the set established categories that we have in the world. When we think of, oh, this is what men should be like, this is what women should be like, this is what good people should be like, this is what bad people should be like. We have all these stereotypes and we have all these set categories as a result of culture, every culture does. The Bhagavata Purana takes those categories and turns them upside down in so many ways to show that really what matters is not your age, it's not your gender, it's not where you were born, where you come from, what your family was, but it's what's in your heart that really matters. It's the devotion that's present within the heart of the individual. That is what really makes them a treasure in the eyes of God and other human beings. One thing I've noticed is that uh, the uh, Krishna temples have spread and are firmly rooted in, in uh, solidly based, and there are a number of them now. So that really is a very solid root. So I think that will continue. Yeah. But I'm wondering what future is there? <laughs> What's the future of religious observance so technical as this, so complicated as this, requiring so much sophistication? Uh, how far can that spread? The perception of what ISKCON was was almost non-existent. It was just a few people in a, in a storefront and there was an Indian Swami lecturing and that was about it. I don't think that they realized that it was anything more than that. ISKCON began a small but dedicated group of followers who saw themselves a, as being very different from their surrounding cultures. And that was important, that was essential for the tradition to take root because traditions like ISKCON that come into a new environment have a certain passion behind them to change the world around them. And that takes dedication and often a small group of people who are ready to put their hearts into doing something different. 
Uh, at the same time, that also creates a very strong distinction from the surrounding culture. But for a tradition to survive in the long term, it needs to integrate. Not integrate too much, otherwise it becomes lost in the surrounding culture. But integrate enough where a community can grow. It's not an isolated pocket, it's not an island. ISKCON has gone from a community of monks and full-time practitioners living in ashrams within temples to a much larger group of devotees who live and work in the world but at the same time maintain their practice of uh, Krishna consciousness. Saints in the Bhakti tradition explain that there are different ways that we can look at the world around us. For instance, someone can look at the world as something that's meant for their enjoyment, for their exploitation, and I think certainly we've seen a lot of that, especially in our modern times. Someone can also look at the world as something that is illusory, that's something to be rejected or escaped from, and seek solitude. What I think is a unique contribution of, of the Bhakti Yoga path is this principle of yukta vairagya, of looking at the world and seeing it as an opportunity to engage with the world around us, and that means to engage with things that seem to be materialistic at first glance, but to engage with them in a spirit of devotion, in a spirit of service, in a spirit of uplifting oneself and uplifting others. The words literally mean renunciation that's guided by principles of wisdom. I grew up in a very wealthy family. Ever since uh, Henry Ford, my great-grandfather, made his fortune, uh, he's given a lot of it away. He and my grandfather, Etzel, they formed the uh, Ford Foundation, uh, which at one time was the largest foundation in the world, and they do work all over the place. And so I was always in that frame of mind that if you have money, you have a responsibility. I first saw the devotees when I was at college, and this was during the 60s and early 70s. Now, I was a hippie, and people were looking for alternative uh, consciousness. I was initiated by Srila Prabhupada in 1975. I was in Detroit when Prabhupada came to visit and he was describing in detail about the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium and his plans for Mayapur. And uh, so he asked me at that point, he said, what do you think of this? I had never been to Mayapur, never heard of it actually. So I said, oh, it sounds very nice. And he said, oh good, so you can help finance. And so uh, I'm, I'm doing my best to see that that happens. Srila Prabhupada used to emphasize the non-sectarian nature of Krishna consciousness and Mayapur projects specifically, that people from around the world were all related. You know, there's certain principles from the Bhagavad Gita that are universal, they apply to everybody. And we designed the temple in such a way so that people who want to come here and worship Krishna we have the main temple room. And then we have a, a temple for Lord Nishingadev. And then the other dome, which is the planetarium wing, will have an actual planetarium there with scientific exhibits and like uh, changing bodies, showing how the spirit soul is different from the body. And there'll also be uh, classrooms there and seminar halls so that scientists can come here and discuss Vedic cosmology. Srila Prabhupada used to say, wherever a man puts his money, that's where his mind is. So my mind is constantly on this project, and it, it really helps me in my consciousness to focus on it. Not that long ago, it was kind of unheard of to have a vegetarian restaurant. And I would dare say that Hare Krishna are probably the first people in Australia to do one. And now, places like the Gold Coast, there's so many. We can see people from all different walks of life, uh, 
are now taking to vegetarian and vegan diets. I always eat at Govinda's, just a natural routine. <laughs> at Govinda's it's a great aspect that we have that we don't push vegetarianism on anybody. We just simply offer a higher alternative. Growing up in such a loving community, family and culture really embodied me such great values and that is the reason I, I'm a Hare Krishna. A strong belief of the Hare Krishnas is that the consciousness that you prepare the food, it, it goes into the food. And if, when food's prepared with love and people receive that, they're naturally gonna outpour with love. We've definitely seen that. The Hare Krishnas, I think they provide a really beautiful service and they make incredible food. <laughs> More and more the importance of vegetarianism has become evident, I feel, with things from factory farming, uh, deforestation, higher increases in horrible diseases like cancer, and all these things have some link to meat eating. And so by offering a higher alternative, such as you know vegetarianism, and it also the most important thing actually is the, the care for the animals and the compassion. teachers, great saints and mystics in the bhakti yoga traditions point out that of all of the practices that one can do, of all the various ways and paths and means of connecting with the divine, of connecting with Krishna in a spirit of love and devotion, chanting, particularly through kirtan, is the most essential and in some ways is the foundation of all the others. So kirtan is um, a Sanskrit word which in its most literal sense means uh, to glorify. This is a glorification that's very much coming from the heart. This is not platitudes or giving someone a lukewarm compliment. This is when you are head over heels in love with someone and you have to shout it from the rooftops and you have to proclaim it and just sing their glories to everyone you meet because it's just, it's overflowing from your heart. a musician, a professional musician, and I'm fortunate enough to experience uh, the, uh, the thrills of being uh, a number one artist in many countries all around the world. I found that uh, music was just completely shaping me and guiding me. And I just wanted to sing, I wanted to drum, and so then started playing in pubs, in clubs, you know, I'd written hits, I played on big hits, um, I had my own group, and I didn't really like how I was becoming, to be honest, I was drinking a lot, uh, other things I won't go into. I could feel myself l losing my soul, actually, I could sense that I was losing something with every gain materially that I was making. And one uh, day I'd come back in our limousine from a big tour and we was driving down our street and my wife, uh, who was called Cheryl at that time, Sachi Mata, she'd heard that I was coming and I was laying back in this limousine, stinking from smoke or whatever, drink and all the other excesses. And I, as, the, as the driver drove me in this limousine down our street, there, she was standing there with our two kids, nice dressed to meet their hero daddy. And I just thought, yeah, God, I can't do this. These are the people who really care about me more than anyone else in the world. And they're welcoming me home like a hero, but I'm just, I'm just slack. And so from that point, I really kind of decided to uh, change my ways. I left, I said, guys, I've had it. I want to pursue healing and helping people and I want to find God. My wife became very interested in the devote issue, which I was quite surprised because I thought they were a little bit nuts and didn't really want to uh, be so associated with them. But um, she's always been cleverer than me and more perceptive than me. So she, she said, no, 
This is the turning point in your life. This is what we're looking for. And indeed it was. I'm originally from Russia, but now I live in the UK with my husband and my little daughter, uh, Anjali. She's a big part of my life, my art, and my everything. I went to a music college where I studied traditional folk, Russian music. Having grown up as a part of this movement and not being of Indian background, um, I always kind of felt a little bit of a clash being in Russia, where it's so sort of straightforward Russian, a little bit even nationalistic, with everything, with art, with just normal uh, association with people, normal relationship. I've always found myself trying to kind of found, find those bridges that link us. engaging my drumming and my other abilities for Krishna. I wasn't sure whether I should be or shouldn't be, but I just, it just felt natural. I realized that it's the essence of Yukta Vairagya, is to engage what you have, not to sit on it or to repress it. And I don't think I could have, I think I'd have been too miserable, because I'm such a hedonist, and I like to have fun, I like to do the things I like to do. I've done lots of different albums over the years, and then I did this thing called uh, Mantra Choir, where invoking Krishna's mercy by singing his names. The reason for Mantra Choir is to create music that's more attuned to a Western ear. So it's an Eastern process, and as beautiful as the Eastern process is with tabla and radanga and harmonium, somewhere or other I'm just too much rock and roll. Can't get rid of it. One of the avenues that Krishna has involved me in and engaged me in in the last um, couple of years, I would say, is Kirtan London, uh, this amazing project that uh, Janavi Harrison has started. The project has a beautiful aim to connect Kirtan lovers, give them some avenues to do what they love together, which is chanting the names of the Lord. Harry Nam goes out every day, about 20 years now, I think it might be that long. I've been coming on Tuesdays and I play an accordion and we just go and terrorise all the people in London. <laughs> I like to smile a lot, I like to engage people as much as we possibly can. In a day we probably 100,000 people see us. People from so many countries come here. So you can sing to all over the world when you come here on Harry Nam. <laughs> I've traveled now pretty much most countries of the world and led the Harinam or been in the Harinams. And everywhere, pretty much everyone appreciates it. They know that we're good people and then they appreciate the fact that we are trying. Some people do, but people may not realize that they're in a compromised position in this world that they are not this body, they're not their problems, they're not their circumstances, they're Atman. So Atman is the self, the true self, the soul, which sits within the heart. And it's been grossly neglected. The medicine is to reconnect with the Atman. That sound vibration within the names of God is the process by which it can actually be re-enlivened or awoken. And so uh, we go out singing those names so that we at least drop the seed in. And so one lifetime or another it will come awake. The seed will fructify and they'll think, let me check out this. Maybe there is something in Jesus. Maybe there is something in life after death. Maybe I'm not this body. Maybe those Hare Krishnas are right. And you know, in one lifetime that will happen. I'm totally convinced of that. This is a serious process. And at the same time, it's the most joyous, for me, of the serious process that you can have. Govinda, Dwaraka was
My recent album, Inevitable Time, we presented to uh, a quite a wide audience with an um, amazing Samadhi dance company from Amsterdam who put together four beautiful dances for the music of the album. We thought, well, what could be better and bigger than the main epic of India, Mahabharat, that we all know and that, that a lot of people would be interested in hearing the message of. I think anything could, could become sacred only by our intention. So if we, if we put the right intention into music, if your goal is to please the Lord and, and also if you chant in order to serve, that makes music sacred, that makes your singing sacred. As far as I understand and as far as I believe, um, Srila Prabhupada really wanted to share what he had. So I think if I share even a little tiny piece of what I got, I would be doing my duty and I would be doing the best for myself and for others. The purpose of my life, uh, I feel, is to realize truly who I am. And I think I'm in the right place. I'm doing what I think I should be doing, which is spreading the holy names around, sprinkling them out as much as I can. Singing and dancing in the bhakti tradition is an expression of how uncontainable the joy is in bhakti. How can we connect our spiritual practice to engagement, to making the world that we live in a better place. The bhakti yoga approach is to engage with the world around us, to improve the world around us, and at the same time to do so from the lens of seeing everything in its relation to divinity. This kind of area, we have to first convince the parents, you know, to send their children to school. And in school, we give them food and all, so that they can eat and study. Because most of these parents, they don't have any sufficient food to give their children. They are sending these people good food. And for the sake of this uh, food and all, the children loves to come to school. We started this project in the year 2004. It was a very humble beginning. On the first day, we went to one school which had only 900 students. And today, 11 years down the road, we have set up 20 kitchens in different parts of the country. We have a presence in eight states and we are feeding 1.2 million kids every day. This program is actually a project of the government of India. Now they have targeted the beneficiaries for this project are those students who cannot go to the affluent schools. These are the free schools, the municipal schools, the government schools, the slum schools. Before the food had started, there were 20, 25 children used to come for studying. And now as soon as that food was started down, now we have more than 200 children eating and studying here. Our role is to make sure that we provide hygienically prepared, nutritious and sanctified meals. This is the cooking area. 
and you see these beautiful vessels these are all stainless steel food grade vessels it is the steam which cooks the food so the nutrients the vitamins they are retained 100% so our day really starts very early at 2 in the morning our cooks have already started putting on the boiler cutting the vegetable cleaning the grains and started cooking by 7:30 in the morning the first vehicle rolls out and it goes to the schools distributing the meals to each school we have 15 routes so on each route whatever the schools are the list is given to the driver and the helper they drop the meals at the end of it on the way back they collect the empty containers and they bring it back for washing besides the government besides the trustees there are many well wishers and donors who are helping us uh, before we committed the funds we had random uh, visits to various schools at lunch time and we eaten what is being served so and we were quite happy i am a jain by religion and one of the tenets of jainism is to fast okay and unfortunately in 51 years i have fasted only once and even on that day when i fasted and our fast means water only for one whole day i remember that i could not even wake up in the morning okay my hands and legs were feeling weak and that has remained with me for life that if one day i am without two meals and if i can be so weak what happens to somebody who is on the street anamrita is doing a super job and rotary has been sponsoring meals all the time this is the most gratifying thing that i have done in 50 years the important factor is that had these children not come to school what would they have done they would be taking up some menial jobs they might come in contact with some mafia they might pick up bad habits they might start smoking at a very young age they might take to drugs they might take alcohol so because there's a lack of education in their life with this project they are attracted to the school by the meal but in the process they are educated and because they are educated their future becomes bright i come from a scientific background i was practicing dentistry when i met devotees and discussed krishna consciousness with them i was very skeptical i was very argumentative at times i was blasphemous but when i heard the arguments they gave and after i read shila prabhupad's books I understood that human life is meant for something much higher than just doing what I was doing before. Seeing the smiles on these children who have these meals is the greatest source of joy for me. The satisfaction that I get that by carrying out this project, I have been instrumental in some way to helping them in getting that one square meal of the day is indeed a great joy. For the bhakta or the practitioner of bhakti, engaged bhakti means how can I manifest the love of God that I'm feeling in my heart in this world, in my relationships with the people who are themselves sparks of the same divine source that I come from. When love of God manifests in the world, it manifests as compassion. simple living high thinking is is a powerful phrase in in so many ways and uh Prabhupada's concern with establishing sustainable communities now has taken the form of the appearance of what is at least globally called eco villages uh, i think people are more and more understanding that our relationship with the non-human world is is quite detrimental and that we need to establish lifestyles that are not just drawing 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 <laughs> uh from life support systems 
but are giving back to it. And it comes back to that central concept that I think is so important in uh, bhakti, which is relationality, that uh, it, it's a give and a take, so that, that we are feeding systems, not just being fed by systems, so that we need to establish ways that don't simply sustain ourselves, but heal ourselves, and now heal the earth in the process. And the way to do that is to simplify our needs. Quando nós chegamos em Nova Gokula, em 1978, Nova Gokula era uma fazenda de latifúndio. Né? Os ex-proprietários plantavam café e cana-de-açúcar. O solo era completamente deteriorado. Né? E com a chegada dos devotos, né? por exemplo, aqui a gente não ouvia passarinhos, só tinha pardal. E, com o passar do tempo, né, os devotos foram deixando a mata vir. Então a mata entrou, nós plantamos muitas árvores também, muita, muita árvore foi plantada. Com o passar do tempo, né, o, com a mata chegando em Nova Gokula, o corredor de fauna veio novamente. Então os passarinhos começaram a vir né, e, e também especificamente nós começamos um projeto aqui em Nova Gokula, oficialmente em 2008, nós entramos em contato com IBAMA. IBAMA é um órgão do governo no Brasil que cuida do meio ambiente. Oferecemos né, a comunidade para um projeto de soltura de pássaros. No Brasil, há muita corrupção, né, muito tráfico. É o que alimenta o crime no Brasil é armas e drogas. Mas o terceiro tráfico que mais alimenta o crime no Brasil é o, o tráfico de animais. E em Nova Gokula, ela está colaborando né, para eliminar né, para, é, o, o tráfico de animais, né, principalmente birds, né, pássaros. Tá? Então, o Ibama apreende os pássaros dos traficantes né, e os pássaros vêm para cá e ficam nos viveiros né, em pré-aclimatação durante... 10, 15 dias. Então, são os pássaros que nós soltamos aqui é, em Nova Gokula é, são pássaros nativos da região. Se não for da região, nós não aceitamos o pássaro, para não haver um desequilíbrio ecológico. Então, no Brasil, nós temos assim, milhares de espécies de pássaros. E o pássaro mais comum é o canarinho da terra, e ele estava em extinção em 2008, não existia mais. E esses pássaros chegam aqui, às vezes, muito humanizados, né? porque às vezes eles viveram na gaiola a vida toda preso. Então, quando eles chegam aqui, nos, nos nossos viveiros, eles têm, a gente tem um trabalho de ensinar eles, às vezes, a voar novamente, porque às vezes eles nem sabiam mais voar. Então, a gente treina as asas né, dele para ele aprender a voar. Né? E quando eles estão aptos para voar, a gente abre o viveiro e ele vai livre. Né? Liberdade! Krishna Valley has a really great reputation of being the largest sustainable eco-village in Europe. Krishna Valley is 270 hectares of land, that's around 700 acres of land. And this, what we can see over here, this is the housing area of Krishna Valley. Here we have 130 devotees living, including 30 children. We have our own water system. So Krishna Valley is completely off the grid, no gas, no water, no electricity is coming in. To be able to feed 100 people a year, you don't need more than one hectare of land. And what we see here, this is one quarter of a hectare. And we grow here uh, pepper and eggplant and a lot of other things like beans, corn, squash. And this provides enough vegetables for the whole community. In terms of vegetables and fruits, we are fully covered, 100% self-sufficient. Radish Yam, or the altar, 
of Krishna Valley uh, is decorated uh, quite eloquently. This is a part of Radhe Shyam's flower garden that provides around 150, 160,000 uh, flowers every year. At the moment, Krishna Valley has 20,000 tourists every year and 10,000 pilgrims. So in this way, we can show our lifestyle and we can show how to live a peaceful life in harmony with nature and in harmony with God. If you look at Krishna Valley at the moment, it's impossible to imagine that there was nothing here. We planted 400,000 trees. It was a sheep run and it was an intensive agricultural land. And uh, when we moved here, we had zero experience in agriculture. I remember that, that story when we tried to have the pumpkin business and we had a contract. All the devotees at the farm at that time, they were engaged in tendering the pumpkin plants. But finally the company came and the company said that not the quality and not the quantity was right for their needs, so they just did not buy anything. So we lost money, we lost the effort, the time, the energy. And there was another thing that we lost at that time, the appetite for pumpkin. Because we ate pumpkin for months and months and months. But we developed quite some new recipes for having pumpkin soup, pumpkin cake, pumpkin drink, pumpkin, whatever you can imagine, everything was pumpkin. We had these kind of experiences in, in the beginning, but at the moment we train others. Bhakti has a great deal to contribute to uh, human interaction with the non-human world, the world we call the world of nature, in so many ways. Uh, I think foundationally it's grounded in that Vedantic vision that uh, we are not separate from the world, but uh, everything is part of a unified reality. And uh, that, that whole reality is a sacred reality. And one of the great delusions, I think, that has gotten us into trouble is to think that human beings are somehow separate from all that. Descritos, né, no Bhagavata Purana, no Shmad Bhagavata, né, Krishna, a gente não vê Krishna caminhando, né, numa cidade como São Paulo, na Avenida Paulista, ali. Krishna está nos bosques de Vrindavana, né, é, junto com os pássaros, Krishna é a fonte de toda beleza, né? E Krishna é o artista supremo, né? Então eu observo nos, nos pássaros, né, um reflexo do poder de Krishna de criar um ser tão belo que voa, né, e que canta, né, tão belamente. Né? When we are aware of the, of the personality in some non-human entity, and personality is pervasive, uh, certainly by the bhakti tradition standards, there is a basis for connecting with the uh, non-human world. And that connection is a, is a form of love. And uh, love has two sides. It has an appreciative side, but there's also a protective side. E a minha motivação é que nós estamos colaborando, né, a ISCOM de Novo Gukula está colaborando, né, com o planeta, né, com o meio ambiente de forma prática. Porque hoje em dia, ser um ambientalista, né, ser um ecologista, não é mais questão de ideologia, é questão de necessidade. As I see, the specific purpose of my life is to help people building communities, uh, sustainable communities. I feel really inspired and really enlivened among the devotees who are here. Eu devo minha vida a isso. Porque Desculpa. 
Eu, eu entrei muito jovem, 15 anos de idade, mas eu me tornei um devoto regular com 18 anos de idade. Naquele momento eu, eu estava envolvido com drogas, né, buscando a libertação né, espiritual através das drogas e parei de estudar. Aí quando eu entrei no, no movimento Hare Krishna na ISCOM, né, eu, eu fui salvo, né? Prabhupada me salvou. There's a maddening pace to life today, and I think uh, simple living, high thinking is a call to taking stock of where we are and asking what have we really gained from that? What is it that, that gives us the most pleasure in life? And I think it's connectivity. It's connectivity to each other, connectivity to place, and we're losing that. So um, we need to return to that. In the global eco-village experiment that is happening everywhere on the planet today, I think is a, is a healthy sign towards that, that certainly embraces and believes that they're embodying uh, a simple, living, high-thinking quality of life. So a higher quality of life, but maybe less quantity of, of stuff. different cultures in South Africa. I'm a Zulu. When we do a transplant from one culture to another, when you take a plant in a garden and you change its location from one and you move it to a different uh, town or a different garden, a different climate, there's two things that will happen. One is that the plant will adapt to its new surroundings, but also the surrounding environment will change as a result too. Most exciting aspect is to give Krishna consciousness to others. Because when you find something very precious, you want to share it with those who you love. Prabhupada spread it all over the world. But he wanted that it should spread in every town and village. And it is happening within 50 years' time. See how Iskon has grown to all kinds of places, to all kinds of countries, involving all kinds of people who practically didn't have any involvement with any spiritual activity. And those individuals are committing themselves so wonderfully. <laughs> It's a four-day festivity and really it showcases the, the entire culture of Krishna consciousness. And I think it's great that we do this, especially that we come to the beach and we come to the people and we show them what Krishna consciousness is. We show them that spiritual life is fun, spiritual life is enlivening it's, and I absolutely love it. I work as a water specialist from 7 in the morning till 5 in the evening. And so then I have my time before work and after work to practice my Krishna consciousness. It was my first year of university. I, I used to write letters to God, so, and I had this jar. And so I wrote a letter to him and I said, Dear God, if you exist, I want to know you. I want to know who you are. How does Bhakti change people's lives? It, it revolutionizes your thinking. It changes completely who you think you are, where you think you are going, and what you think you are going to do with your life. It's made me a more conscious person, and it's, it's really taught me to slow down, because I was such a goal-oriented person, and so driven, and, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, I still am, but I was driven towards things that wouldn't have benefited me, or they wouldn't have fulfilled me in the ways I was looking for. Krishna, Krishna, Hare, Hare. My practice of Krishna consciousness with my family has actually been very difficult. My family, they're all Christians. 
My mother is also a very staunch Christian. And we went through a very difficult time. It was 2014 and I had the amazing opportunity to go to India and to go sing in India and go to Vrindavan, which for a devotee is like, oh my gosh. And my mother was like, if you go on this trip to India, you are no longer my daughter. That was honestly like the most devastating thing, gosh. Yeah, it was a very difficult thing. I mean, this is my mother, this person is supposed to love me no matter what. I did choose to go to India, I did go. It was an amazing trip. And before I went, though, my, my older sister reconciled the situation. And she's also a Christian, but she was able to help my mother understand that I'm not choosing my faith over her, but this is an experience I want to have. The Zulu culture is very ancestor driven and it's very family oriented. And also in South Africa, Nguni cultures have lost a lot of their philosophy. So a lot of practices are done just for the sake of being done. In my naivety and my Krishna consciousness practice, I would definitely say no, these things are not compatible at all because this is that and Krishna consciousness is this. But the values that I've learned from my family, the values and the lessons and the respect, the sense of Ubuntu, which is togetherness or caring for, one of, for each other and empathy and humanity, that's something that I definitely learned from my culture and those are values that are reinforced in my practice of Krishna consciousness. We acknowledge our differences, we embrace them, and then we use them to our advantage. I would like to think that I am becoming a strong woman in Krishna consciousness. I'm not feeding 500 people a day, I'm not having 10,000 people chanting. You know, it's definitely not large scale, but what we've tried to do is have heart-to-heart -heart connections with people. That's what I've understood what trying to be a devotee is. It's trying to live a life that I can give the best, which is Krishna to other people. So in a direct way, by giving a book, or in an indirect way, by being a good friend, or just being a good person. And it's about living a life of empathy and living a life of love and sharing that love. в Армении. Познакомился с сознанием Кришны на улице, когда мне подошел ко мне преданный. Тогда запрещалось еще в 86 году. И я сказал, а у вас есть что-то? У него сумка такая закрыта, он посмотрел по сторонам там. Рядом с милицией мы были. Никого не было на улице. Он открыл сумку и показал мне книги. Я выбрал Бхагавангиту и купил. Книги — это основа. Книги — то, что я люблю. У меня есть три вида основных служений. Это распространять книги Шарапабхупады, обучать распространению книг и еще женой заботиться о преданных. В Армении власти какое-то время тоже, как и все, в Советском Союзе бывшем не очень были привлечены, увлечены с принимать сознание Кришны. Наоборот, они думали, что это будет влиять на людей, что они не будут послушны уже, да. И некоторые думали, что сознание Кришны это просто приводит к тому, что люди с ума сходят. В психушки помещали преданных, кололи разными лекарствами. У меня тоже такой опыт был. Я стал распространять книги человеку, который был таким влиятельным очень. Он был в гражданской одежде. И меня задержали, очень хорошо избили, много часов избивали. Потом меня отвезли в тюрьму. Но это все скрыто, никому не говорили. Я пропал без вести с машиной, с книгами. 
Просто 10 дней обо мне никто ничего не знал. Никто не знал, где я, что я. Они избивали, издевались, совали в рот сигарету. У меня голова стала как тыква какое-то время. Тыква, представляете, как вот она такая бесформенная немножко. 9-10 дней я ничего не ел, лежал, только пил воду. И повторял Гарри Кришна каждый день. Московское общество сознания Кришны получило регистрацию в 1988 году. Это был непростой такой тоже процесс. Надо здесь пояснить, что в Советском Союзе все принципиальные вопросы решались коммунистической партией. Ну, я написал краткую такую справку о том, что полезно будет зарегистрировать общество сознания Кришны. И я привел два аргумента. Первый, что они не против советской власти. И второе, что они добровольно отказываются от мяса. И это полезно, потому что мяса не хватает. Есть ответ от Прабхупады, от Кришны. То есть на наш зов души на наше служение, на наше желание служить, обязательно есть ответ. И этот ответ любовный, трансцендентный, и оно топит сердце. И вот я чувствую, мое сердце смягчается. Love is also a form of wisdom. And to know more fully, to study, to be a scholar, can also be a kind of intellectual bhakti, intellectual devotion. The bhakti movement is essentially a teaching movement. It's an educational movement. Education in all societies can talk about so many things, the different natural sciences, the social sciences, the human sciences. What's so ironic is what is conspicuous by its absence how to love, how to connect with others' hearts, how to develop compassion, how to be sensitive to the thoughts and feelings of others. This is a real education. Teaching is really the reason I got into academia in the first place. I mean, I love to do research and I love to study, but teaching really, for me, gives the motivation for doing academia. It's not something that I add on to the side, but really the heart of what I do. Uh, the ability to go into the classroom and meet students face to face and introduce them to the huge variety of religious experience that's present in the world and watch their world broaden. There's no experience that's more satisfying uh, than that. I have a teaching degree, so my primary job is teaching, and I taught for 15 years at Alachua Learning Center, teaching third grade. But about 10 years into my teaching, I started to realize that I had more to give. So I decided to go into a master's program in administration. And I finished that, and I was kind of, in the back of my mind, something that I had always wanted to do was to open a school. So Bhaktivedanta Academy needed a school, and I wanted to form a school, and so the two paths converged. The Chaitanya Vaishnava tradition is the one that I grew up in, and it's one that I've practiced for my whole life. So I have a strong devotion, and I think an understanding of that tradition from the inside as well. But the, the perspective of someone on the inside uh, is very well supplemented by the perspective of academia and academics uh, because it gives you a perspective that is also from a distance in terms of history and context from the outside. And so what I really wanted to, to do in academia is to really see the tradition from a very well-rounded and holistic perspective. Um, they teach science, they teach mathematics, and lots of other stuff, including about Krishna. And so that's why I really like the school. I wanted to create a school that had many parts to it. One was academic rigor. 
I wanted something to be so devotionally uh, conscious that when students left, they felt in their hearts that they were devotees of Krishna. That there was not a sense of, am I or aren't I? It's like, that's what I am. And then the other part was that I wanted them to have exploration. So I thought that many uh, young people, because I'd worked with them in other spheres, they didn't know what they wanted to do and they didn't know who they were. And many times it was because they had never tried things. So we have a whole section called Exploratory Wheel where they get to try things like uh, business class and creative things and making jam and you know all sorts of types of things in lots of different areas and arts and music to get a sense of who they are and give it a try. I grew up mostly in Southern California, but at about 10 years old, uh, we moved to Illinois, and I wasn't around any devotees. And so I finished high school in that environment. When I was in public school, it was two personas. I was Jaya. I wasn't Jairate anymore. I was a vegetarian and I had a weird name and you construct the whole story and your parents were hippies and they went to India and that's why you're weird and different. And I always felt this like differentness, that there was this core of who I was and then I built all of these layers to describe myself to the outside world. So I decided to stay in ISKCON and primarily stay as a devotee of Krishna. Uh, because of a transformational experience I had. I actually believe that every young person who grows up has to have it. Like there's this moment in time where you make a choice. And for me, it was when I graduated high school. I was 16 and I was looking to do something for the summer. And my mother suggested I go out to Los Angeles and live in the ashram. Well, I thought about that and I was like, okay, I'm willing to take adventure. I'll just go for the adventure. So I went to LA and I lived in the ashram and it was as if it was like, wait, I can just be the core? I can just be that and it'll be okay? And then I had that like blissed out experience. It was like I was integrated for the first time that my outside and my inside matched. And I knew I was home then. I work in the world like everyone else does. I maintain a family. Uh, I have a day-to-day -day job that's full of stress at times. Whenever I, I make a decision about what I want to do in life, uh, I try to consider two things. Uh, what's going to be best for me and for my family, but also how can this be of some service to Krishna, to God, and to the um, larger community and society. Uh, because I feel that no doubt it's important to do what's good for me, but I feel that life has a lot more meaning if it is also beneficial to others. I interact a lot with people and I connect and that's, that's my process is connection. So it goes the same with my relationship with God, like I want to connect. I try to see everything in relation to Him, so if I'm struggling, I'm calling out and if I'm not, I'm, gra I'm expressing gratitude, like I'm always trying to incorporate a spiritual understanding within my life. My greatest fear in my life, I used to think, was failure. But I'm really getting pretty good at failure <laughs> in a lot of ways. And so I realized that uh, my greatest fear is not dreaming high enough, not reaching high enough so that I'll just be complacent and satisfied. I'm a person who loves being with others and finds meaning with others. And I think that's also at the heart of bhakti. Isolation is the greatest fear that I have. My mother was pregnant when Srila Prabhupada passed away from this planet. She was pregnant with me. And she actually thought that she might have a miscarriage because she was in so much pain, emotional pain from his passing. And I, I, feel, I feel that emotion that, so strongly when I think about and talk about Srila Prabhupada of, uh, of loss and regret that, that I 
I just don't want his mission to go in vain. When I signed the incorporation papers in New York, I had absolutely no idea that it would develop into a, a worldwide movement. The fact that it began in such a small way, I think really is testimony to the miracle that uh, Prabhupada's story and ISKCON's history really is. It's important that we live out our religion by the works we do, and it's important that we have a certain wisdom and knowledge in our traditions. But I think for most of us as human beings, flesh and blood human beings, this element of devotion and heartfelt participation is also part of something, anything that's fully human. I am Krishna's and he is mine. And we have this loving relationship. Get into that and enjoy that. So that for me is, you know, that's it.